Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Veronica Nilsson, and I am the head of the Global Deal Support Unit. Um, I see that people are still entering this meeting room, but I think we should get started as we have uh, quite a long agenda to get through today. Uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome you to um, uh, today's uh, session of the masterclass series on sound industrial relations. This is the fifth and the final session. And I want to thank all those of you that have been with us from the start, and in particular, the ITC, the International Training Center of the ILO, and Sylvain Baffi, who has led all these five sessions. It has really been great to, to work together. Um, and I think you've done a fantastic job in developing the, uh, this masterclass series for us, uh, which is based on the ILO Industrial Relations Global e Toolkit. So many of you have participated in several of these sessions, uh, but I think we have a few, or at least a few uh, newcomers today. So let me tell you that the training material uh, is available on the ITC website, but you can also access it from the Global Deal website, including the recordings of uh, these five sessions. Uh, the previous sessions have covered grievance handling, workplace cooperation, collective bargaining, and last week we discussed industrial relations in times of crisis. Today, uh, we are going to focus on gender equality and non-discrimination in the workplace. Uh, besides learning about the ILO training modules on industrial relations, gender, non-discrimination, violence, and harassment, I'm very much looking forward to the presentations uh, that we will hear today uh, about how we can achieve gender equality. I also want to mention that we have recently published a revised version of the Global Deal Brief on the contribution of social dialogue uh, to gender equality. Uh, it has uh, several examples and good practices to get inspiration from, and it's available on our website, not only in English, but it has also been translated into French, Spanish, and most recently the uh, ILO office in Lisbon has also translated it into Portuguese. Uh, this masterclass series is part of a broader capacity building program that we launched for Global Deal Partners at the end of last year to strengthen capacity to enable effective social dialogue and industrial relations. Uh, you might also be interested in our self-guided e-learning course on social dialogue and the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and this is also a tool that we have developed together with the ITC and that we launched at the beginning of this month, actually and that you can also uh, uh, get access to either through the website or if you go directly to the ITC website. Uh, and in addition to the gender brief, you will also find other briefs and publications and good practices on our website. But I think I will stop here. Uh, it's now time for me to um, give the floor to Sylvain who will present uh, today's agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica, and thanks for your kind words. And uh, welcome everybody to this uh, uh, fifth uh, masterclass series, uh, fifth masterclass on uh, sound industrial relations. So, uh, as we usually do, let's take a look to uh, what we have planned for today uh, uh, and uh, what we would like, uh, uh, how we would like these uh, sessions to be uh, to be run today. So. Uh, we're going to have a short introduction to the session, uh, just a few questions at the beginning to, uh, let's say, set the scene for today's uh, presentation. And then uh, we have a number of uh, ILO officials that, will be, uh, that we are very happy to welcome and to have with us uh, that will uh, tell us a bit about what the ILO is doing in the promotion of gender equality uh, through social data. So our first colleague uh, is Verena Schmidt, who is working in the uh, Inclusive Labor Market, Labor Relations and Working Conditions branch of the ILO. She's a Labor Relations and Collective Bargaining Specialist. And uh, she will tell us about the contribution of sound industrial relations to gender inequality and non-discrimination, and about what the ILO uh, has been doing in that field. We're also very happy to have with us uh, Jessica Wan, a Gender Specialist in the Better Work Program, uh, that will tell us about uh, achieving um, uh, gender equality through social dialogue in the global garment industry. 
challenges and impact of the better work at factory level. So uh, Jessica Wan is with us and she will deliver uh, that presentation. Uh, before we move to this introduction to these new training models on uh, industrial relation, gender, non-discrimination, violence and harassment, we'll be very pleased with uh, Andrea Isabel Franconi, who is an expert on labor relation and gender equality, to present to you these newly developed models. Um, we have put it a bit of time together uh, for questions and answers and interaction with participants. We have received many questions uh, before that session, so thanks very much for all those that have been raising questions. Uh, they've been transmitted to our panelists uh, or to our different experts, and I know that they've been prepared and they will try to do their best uh, to answer to, um, to, to, to these questions during their presentation. I would also like to encourage you very much uh, to use the chat box uh, uh, during the session. Any questions to our experts, any comments, anything that you'd like to raise, please do not hesitate to use, to use the, the chat box uh, for raising those comments. Our experts might be answering directly live to you, but uh, we would like very much uh, um, to, to devote uh, these uh, 20 minutes of questions and answers to uh, answering your questions, interacting, hearing from you, hearing stories uh, that you might have to tell, and uh, trying to get uh, extra information from our different uh, resource persons. So this is what we've planned until uh, uh, 3.20, where we will be uh, moving to the closure, and uh, we will be uh, having some closing remarks and uh, finishing this uh, series of, of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of masterclass. So thanks everybody for being uh, with us. Thanks very much, very pleased that we have a chance to discuss this matter together. And in order to start, and before I give the floor to uh, Verena, uh, we have prepared some questions for you that we would like to, um, to, to ask you. Um, uh, and I think everybody now is aware of um, the different polls that we create and how to answer to them. I think that you can see on your screen right now that a first question has appeared. What do you think is the gender gap of the labor force participation rate at global level? So this information is taken from that publication called the contribution of social dialogue to gender equality. The data are from 2017. I will tell you a bit more about that publication later, but just take a few seconds to think about what do you believe is the gender gap, gap of the labor force participation rate at global level. So a few seconds to think about it before we reveal you what is the correct answer. Okay. Few seconds for those that did not have a chance to vote. Okay, so let me share the results. Uh, and indeed, uh, the uh, correct answer is 26.5%. This is uh, uh, um, the gender gap of the uh, labor force uh, participation rate at global level. So, congratulations to 52% of our participants. Uh, that knew in advance uh, the answer to that question. And uh, let's move to a second question. What do you think is the gender pay gap at global level uh, calculated uh, in hourly uh, pay? So you've got four possible answers to that. Do you think it's 11%? Do you think it's 17%? Do you think it's 20%? Do you think it's 25%? We are talking about the gender pay gap at the global level. So let's take a few seconds. Okay. And let me share the results. So those are the answers to that question. Uh, most of you believe that it is 25%. Uh, we must say that the figures is pretty bad, but it's not as bad as 25%. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, 20%. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, actually 20% uh, is a gender pay gap at uh, global level. So still a very impressive uh, um, 
uh, and uh, and um, let's say uh, it's raised a lot of concern, but actually uh, it's not 25 percent, but it's uh, uh, 20 percent. Let me move to another poll, still a bit talking about percentage. These figures are taking from uh, uh, global, still from the same publication on the contribution of social dialogue to gender equality. What do you believe is a percentage of women that are representing employers as chairperson on standing committees? Uh, is it 15, 18, 26, or 34 percent? You have still a few seconds. to vote. Okay. And okay, let me end the poll. And actually, uh, most of you say 15%. Still, it's not that bad, even if it's still very poor. It's 18%, uh, according to that study, 18% of the women, of people representing employers as chairperson on standing committee are women. So 18%, uh, if you really think it means 82% are men. So I think that gives us an idea of uh, the difference between representation on the two sex. And let's move to our last question of the day. How much of the total time spent in unpaid care work do you think is performed by women? Do you think it's seven to two percent? Do you think it's 25 percent? Or do you think it's 50 percent? So. Let's still take few seconds and let me close the poll right now and indeed uh, the answer is 72.6 percent of unpaid care work time is performed by a woman this data is coming from another ILO publication that was uh, published in, in 2018 called A Quentin Leap for Gender Equality for a Better Future of Work for All. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating in this poll. Uh, I think that's always very interesting to put some figures and some numbers uh, behind some uh, concepts. Uh, so I think it was a, a good way to actually introduce uh, our first presentation also because this report that we mentioned on global this uh, global deal thematic brief on the contribution of social dialogue to gender equality has been as very much contributed to the input of our first speaker uh, Verena Schmidt uh, from the labor relations and working condition branch of the ILO uh, as i mentioned before Verena is a specialist in labor relations and collective bargaining and I know that she's been also a gender specialist uh, in uh, some years ago in uh, uh, Steel for the Isle. So Verena, many thanks for being with us. We are very much looking forward to hearing from you and very much looking forward to understand better what the Isle is doing for the promotion of gender equality through sound industrial relations. So Verena, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvain, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very uh, pleased to be here, and uh, thank you very much uh, to the global team there for inviting me. So I will um, yeah, briefly, I, I realized from the poll and also from the very good questions you asked uh, through email that already there's a lot of uh, knowledge on gender equality amongst the participants. Um, so I will briefly, very briefly talk about the ILO framework on gender equality, uh, which I think most of you are familiar with, and then talk about some of the benefits of gender equality, um, and also the impact of um, uh, COVID-19 on gender equality, and then um, I conclude with some uh, possible policy uh, responses from the, from the three constituents. Um, so starting with the, with the second slide um, on the ILO legal framework of gender equality, um, I just listed the five most important um, conventions here, uh, and I'll go really very quickly through them. I just talk a little bit longer about uh, 190, Convention 190, given that it's um, fairly recent. So the first one uh, that is listed, the first two that I listed are, are core conventions from the ILO. 
meaning um, that uh, they uh, should be implemented by all member states, regardless of uh, ratification of whether they've been ratified or not, but uh, both of them are also very widely um, ratified. Um, so uh, Equal Remuneration Convention actually turned 70 years already uh, this year. Um, and what is very important about this is um, that it doesn't only talk about uh, pay directly, but it includes, uh, for example, overtime bonuses, which is very important, uh, particularly um, for men uh, in many countries of the world, uh, and also other benefits. And it uh, already includes the possibility of job evaluations. Um, so I find it very impressive that uh, already 70 years ago, it was so far reaching and so uh, thought through in a way. Um, discrimination, uh, uh, which was uh, adopted in 58, uh, very important talks about direct and indirect discrimination. So not only um, about this direct discrimination, meaning if an employer says, I will only employ uh, men because they are stronger, for example, uh, but also uh, if uh, what used to be the case for, uh, for example, airline industries, that you do uh, have a minimum height requirement for pilots of one meter 80, this would be an indirect discrimination because me most men are taller than, on average men are taller than women. So it talks about direct and indirect uh, uh, discrimination. Uh, workers with family responsibilities, where the title uh, says it already, is about measures to promote um, uh, family and uh, professional life, work and family life uh, reconciliation, uh, maternity protection convention, um, introduced 14 weeks minimum uh, of maternity leave, of which six weeks have to be postnatal. And um, I have a specific slide uh, on convention uh, 190. Uh, now, first of all, on uh, 190, um, one, one colleague asked, uh, why is it not ratified more? Or what it, why is it so difficult to ratify? Now, this was only um, adopted in 2019, so two years ago. It will come into effect uh, on the 25th of June um, this year uh, during the International Labour Conference. Uh, and it's a bit of a process for the member states to actually ratify a convention. Uh, so in the, uh, it's a constitutional obligation to submit um, conventions to the relevant authority in the member states uh, within one year, 18 months maximum, but uh, there's, there's often a waiting times of, of several years before it is actually discussed in parliament. Um, however, five countries have already ratified it, which I think is a, is a great success. And uh, uh, two more countries will ratify soon. The, the five that have already ratified are Argentina, Fiji, uh, Namibia, Somalia, and Uruguay. And uh, Greece and Hungary have also announced that they will ratify. And I believe also Italy. Um, so uh, what, is, uh, what is it about uh, the, uh, this convention? Uh, first of all, it has, uh, for the first time, a definition, uh, an international definition of violence and harassment. And there are very long discussions about this, what is violence and what is harassment. Um, so I encourage you to read this convention. If you Google ILO Convention 190, you'll find it very easily. Um, it, the convention also acknowledges that gender-based violence and harassment disproportionately uh, affects women and girls. Um, and uh, it requires member states to adopt, and this is why it's important for social dialogue, in consultation with employers and workers an inclusive, integrated, and gender uh, responsive approach. Um, so this is, uh, this is very important. Uh, social dialogue really plays a very big role in the, in the implementation. Uh, it also includes uh, a grievance handling mechanism to address uh, violence and harassment, and one of you um, was asking uh, about this, this was one of the questions. Uh, so just very briefly, uh, in Article uh, 10 of the Convention, it uh, specifically establishes that each member state shall take appropriate measures to ensure easy access to appropriate and effective remedies and safe uh, reporting and dispute resolution mechanisms in case of violence and harassment in the world of work. And um, it um, specifically talks about the protection 
of those who have been uh, survivors of sexual uh, harassment and um, it forbids any form of uh, retaliation. Um, so to move on, um, and uh, if there's any questions of the, on the conventions, of course, uh, we can uh, discuss later and the other colleagues might also, the other presenters might also add something. Uh, what are potential benefits for on gender equality? Um, benefits to employers. Uh, first of all, uh, there have been various studies to show that the retention rate is much higher uh, of women if you have adequately paid maternity leave but also uh, policies to reconcile uh, family uh, and private life. For example, by providing a crash at the, at the company or by allowing some more flexible times for young parents. Uh, also, of course, uh, increased productivity of women uh, uh, by reducing discriminatory practices. Um, this is also for men. And increasingly, we had uh, issues uh, in some countries that men were asking for longer periods of parental leave and they were being discriminated. So the more they feel safe at the workplace, uh, the better this will be for their productivity. Uh, reduced absenteeism. If there's good workplace solutions for childcare, for example, as I said, the crash or some form of flexible or home working, uh, teleworking practices. Uh, and of course, also an enhanced recruitment of women, which means we have a larger talent pool. For trade unions, I think it's uh, easier because uh, in many countries, trade unions uh, have normative uh, ideas, a normative uh, framework on equality, including on gender equality. Um, and uh, also um, they are in favor of eliminating any discrimination and increase. Uh, social justice, of which uh, gender equality is an important point. Uh, and of course, meeting the demands of their own uh, constituents, of their own members, female members in relation to uh, work-life balances uh, and other issues. Now, moving on, um, how has COVID-19 uh, impacted uh, gender equality? And in short, I think we can say um, that it's been quite a uh, uh, very negative. Uh, the, um, the, the few advances we have made uh, in terms of closing the gender gap in terms of pay and also uh, participation rate have been widening again during the crisis. And we also have an increased uh, occurrence of uh, domestic violence and other forms of uh, harassment, uh, given that uh, Often uh, when both partners are at home, they live in close uh, domestic proximity, which apparently, and, and increased stress, uh, which leads apparently to increased uh, violence, sadly enough. Uh, so um, there's a real danger that uh, unless policies specifically address women now, and unless we have a building back, building back better, as we say now in the ILO, uh, there will be um, a very, adverse consequences for women uh, due to COVID-19. Um, but I want to mention some uh, positive practices uh, that are, have occurred uh, during uh, COVID-19. Uh, one example in Argentina, um, the uh, social partners, both employers and workers organizations from the domestic work sector uh, successfully lobbied the government uh, to obtain an extension of the emergency income support to domestic workers. And this is really quite extraordinary because a lot of them are informal, uh, and yet they found a way to extend the payments to them, which is extremely important because uh, a lot of the employers, private households, were concerned uh, to uh, get infected through their domestic workers. So they laid them off, sometimes without any um, severance pay or any form of compensation. So this um, emergency income support was extremely important uh, really for their survival. And it was a huge uh, success um, that they achieved this. Uh, another example from uh, Germany um, is that uh, a collective agreement was agreed in the care sector and the public uh, care sector, uh, which included a pay rise of 8.7% uh, for the care workers and up to 10% for int intensive care workers, uh, both of which are predominantly women. And uh, in addition to that, 
a premium was also paid for those who worked during COVID-19. And the idea of this is was uh, that particularly in the beginning, uh, the workers didn't have, the, those frontline workers were particularly at risk uh, to get infected with COVID-19, uh, personal protective equipment was not there um, uh, sufficiently. They worked a lot of overtime. Um, so uh, these workers all got a, a premium, which was, um, which was very important. Um, now, uh, in the concluding remarks, I want to uh, just address very briefly the, some of the recommendations. And this is all from the, from the uh, thematic brief that um, Sylvain already mentioned. Um, and one of you asked specifically about governments in the, in the mess. So I want to um, just mention specifically on governments. I mean, obviously, promote tripartite social dialogue and gender mainstreaming overall. It also means ratifying and, and effectively implementing the convention that I'm, conventions that I mentioned in the beginning, and of course, also the core conventions on collective bargaining and, and labor relations. Um, encourage uh, social partners to engage in dialogue on gender equality, including collective uh, agreements. And one of the ways how they can support this is for how government can support this is, for example, by providing gender specific data in different sectors uh, so that there's informed decisions about uh, collective agreements and future uh, employment prospects also in these areas. Um, and uh, for the employers' organizations, uh, one of the recommendations is to promote women's participation in, and representation in the workplace and also in employers' organizations. And lastly, for workers' organizations, as I said, they already have the normative framework, which is very strong on equality, but um, I think there's scope for improvement also to organize more women and promote more women leaders. And one of you was asking in the maritime sector, uh, what can be done there? Um, I think the MUA in Australia, the Maritime Union of Australia, um, has a great example on um, what can be done. Uh, for example, uh, 10 years ago, uh, they started, the Deputy General Secretary McDormand at the time, uh, started a pledge that all men, all seafarers, took a pledge uh, never to hurt or assault their own wives and to always stand up if they hear any harassment or joke being told about women. And this was a very powerful tool. Tens of, tens of thousands of men uh, took this pledge and it was a very important uh, tool. Um, and it was also adopted, I think, by the, by the uh, ITF in the meantime and for, by the International Transport Federation. Uh, so I'd like to uh, close here uh, and refer you again to the, to the brief that was published and funded by the Global Deal. And thank you very much. And I look forward to the questions and discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Verena. Thanks very much for this presentation. Uh, obviously, all questions to Verena can be posted uh, on the on the chat box. Uh, uh, she can answer the, to them directly, or she might uh, raise uh, during the question and answer. Uh, try to uh, answer to them uh, orally. But uh, thank you very much, Verena, and thank you very much for giving this uh, overview of what the ILO is doing. Now I'm very pleased to uh, invite another colleague uh, to take the floor. Her name is uh, Jessica Wan. Uh, she's a gender specialist in the Better Work program of the ILO. She's based in Bangkok. And uh, Jessica will tell us uh, what the Better Work program is doing for achieving uh, gender equality through social dialogue in the global garment industry. So Jessica, thank you so much for being with us. And the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Savan. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to share Better Works experience in promoting gender equality through social dialogue in the garment sector with you today. Uh, next slide, please. So why are we focusing on gender equality? Well, first and foremost, women are the drivers of the garment sector, both as workers and consumers. 80% uh, of the 60 million garment workers globally are women, and 90% of the apparel consumers are also women. And the garment sector has offered an opportunity to improve the lives of millions of workers, particularly women workers and their families through access to formal employment. And in many instances in the countries that Border Work works in, the sector is one of the few avenues for formal and paid employment. 
And despite the fact that women are the majority of the garment workers, they are largely concentrated in lower paid and lower skilled occupations, such as sewing operators, cleaners, or helpers, compared with men. And not only are women largely underrepresented in leadership positions, they're also more at risk of discrimination in the workplace. We have seen discriminatory hiring practices, such as pregnancy screenings, as well as a higher risk of gender-based violence and harassment. And we also see difficulties with workers balancing work and family responsibilities. While it's a challenge for both women and men workers because of the fact that women are shouldering the majority of household and care responsibilities, as we saw in our uh, fun quiz earlier, uh, it becomes a double burden for women workers. And this is further compounded by challenges in accessing sexual and reproductive health rights, including pre and postnatal health services, maternity protection, and access to childcare facilities. And we also find that women are largely underrepresented as workers and management representatives in the workplace, as well as in social dialogue processes. However, Better Work finds that promoting women's empowerment and gender equality is a win-win for workers, their families, employers, industries, and local and national economies. And by investing in gender equal workplaces, we not only see improvements for workers the, and, and their lives at work and at home, but a knockoff effect in their families and the communities. But we also see that workplaces that are more equal and inclusive and promote decent work are more profitable and productive. Um, second slide, please. And those of you who've had the privilege of um, attending the sessions of my colleagues earlier, um, just to give a recap for those who don't know much about better work, uh, we promote and improve compliance at the factory level through a combination of services in assessment, training, and advisory. So now I just want to take a bit of time to just share what we learned about gender equality and social dialogue and based on both a combination of independent academic research conducted about our program by Tufts University and also our experience and analysis. And this is what we've learned. Um, through better work, we see a decrease in gender pay gap by 17%. And if we compare factories from the first and fourth assessment, um, factories who've been through four cycles of better work services see an elimination of 85% of the pay gap that was observed in the first assessment. And why is this the case? Uh, we found that the gender pay gap is not only due to the types of jobs that women hold, as I mentioned earlier, sewing operators, cleaners, or helpers, but also their ability to balance work and family responsibilities. And that in turn affects their ability to attain voluntary bonuses for attendance and productivity. And how we address the pay gap is through addressing the root causes. So by promoting women in leadership positions and also fostering more gender equal and inclusive workplace policies and systems, particularly related to hiring practices, access to promotions and trainings and maternity protections, and also other measures to support workers in meeting their family responsibilities and through which we see a decrease in the gender pay gap. Uh, next slide, please. And through our engagement with factories, we see a reduction of sexual harassment concerns by up to 18%. And I think back to Verena's presentation earlier, that linkage about sexual harassment and productivity is clear. We found that the fear of sexual harassment decreases when we have more women in leadership positions, especially in line supervisors. And the direct business benefits is that workers are able to meet their production targets at a better rate. And we see a, a reduction in meeting targets by one hour and 18 minutes in the lines when there is a lower fear of harassment. And we also see that there, the, with lower prevalence of sexual harassment, businesses are more profitable because of lower costs. So both indirect and direct costs attributed to attrition rates, absenteeism and presenteeism rates. Uh, next slide, please. And through our experience, we also see that investing in women and gender equality, women have greater access to prenatal care as much as 26%. And we also see the knockoff effect for families, including improved health and education outcomes. To give an example, in Jordan, um, in Better Work Factories, we see that workers increase um, sending remittances by 33%. And when we talked to workers about how these remittances are used, they talked about debt repayment in their families, but in most cases, investments in education, healthcare, and nutrition for both local and migrant workers. Next slide, please. And now we're getting to like the heart of what we want to talk about today is why social dialogue is a key to gender equality in the sector. And um, in our experiences with worker and management committees that are freely elected, 
we see more improvements in working conditions when there's a proportional number of women representatives in the committees. And when we look into why this is the case, it is the fact that when you have a well-functioning worker management committee, there is more collaboration and innovation in problem solving and also risk mitigation. But we only see this when there are women present in these committees and not only the number of women, but women actively engaging in social dialogue processes in the factories. Next slide, please. And just to sum up from what I shared just now, our experiences just showed that gender equality and social dialogue are not only drivers of social compliance and also decent work, but it has a positive benefit to businesses. It increases productivity and profitability. Next slide, please. And based on what we learned and what I just shared from the research findings um, from Tufts University, we built our gender strategy across four strategic pillars. And this is also based on our experiences in the country programs. So we identified four priority areas of intervention, one on discrimination, voice and representation, paid work and care, and also leadership and skills development. And before I jump into kind of a description of some of our interventions, I want to just describe how we approach these issues. One, we address these issues primarily through worker and management committees, but also relevant stakeholders in the workplace and also beyond in the supply chain. But most of our interventions have the following ingredients. First, we start by awareness raising. We ensure that all relevant stakeholders understand what the issues are, the root causes, and building both the human rights and business case for action. And because it is about gender equality and inclusion, we believe it's paramount to change norms and attitudes and then behavior. So to address the root causes of gender equality, we raise awareness and do a lot of gender reflections and for um, workers, managers, and other stakeholders to understand how norms, gender roles, and expectations play out not only at home, but also in the workplace. And we have a particular focus on male engagement and increasingly focusing on engaging senior management on gender equality and inclusion. And as those of you who I know working on gender equality, changing norms is a very difficult task and it's very long term, but we know that this is a key ingredient in promoting equal and inclusive workplaces. So after awareness raising, after reflecting on norms, we then focus on capacity building. And this is done so through skills development, whether it's communication skills or problem solving skills, we build the capacity of stakeholders to solve the problems at hand. And this is also done through sharing best practices through the ILO and Better Works experiences, which is why this IR toolkit is extremely helpful because we can take the lessons and the, and the key learnings from this toolkit to share with worker management committees and our stakeholders. In addition to training and capacity building, Better Work builds an enabling and inclusive ecosystem at the workplace and beyond. Within the workplace, we focus on policies and management systems in ensuring that workplace systems are adequate in not only mitigating the risks of gender inequality, but also responding to gender inequality, as well as taking an opportunity to promote equality and inclusion. And beyond the workplace, we look at creating an enabling environment, looking at how different industry and supply chain stakeholders, as well as our constituents, can work together to address inequalities that we see. And now I want to shift the attention to some of the services that we provide in, in, in the factories. So on discrimination, a big pillar of our work is, of course, on C190. Uh, and what we do is we provide um, training of trainers for worker management committee members. So we build their capacity for them to then deliver their own internal trainings uh, as a preventive measure. And oftentimes, we use, after our trainings, they develop their own internal training plans and awareness raising initiatives. In addition to having these trainings, we look at a workplace diagnostic on work uh, policies and management systems around violence and harassment. To give an example, in Nicaragua right now, we're working on work with the worker and management committees to interview um, senior management, middle management, and workers to understand how existing policies and grievance mechanisms are actually being implemented. They look great on paper, but we want to know how they're being operationalized. And based on these findings, we're working in a participatory way with the committees in supporting the factories and adopting more gender sensitive and a victim centered approach by strengthening the grievance mechanisms. Again, you know, really building off of the work that's in the IRO toolkit and drawing lessons from there. And on voice and representation, overall, better work 
ensures that we have gender equal representation in the worker management committees to pr promote proportional representation. So this could be in, including uh, initiatives such as ensuring that women are running for elections and, and to equipping them with the skills to, to take on roles as workers representatives. And beyond having women in seats in the committees, we are ensuring that when we facilitate social dialogue, that women are actively voicing and engaging in the committees. And as well, we make sure that both committee members, women and men, are discussing issues related to gender equality and inclusion. Uh, and in Cambodia, we're, we piloted uh, over the last two years a female and male trade union leadership program for workers reps and trade union, union representatives. And what we do is we train women and men representatives separately. And in this training, we equip them with the key skills that they need to become representatives. So we look at um, soft skills such as communication, active listening, what it means to be a representative and how do you represent the interests and needs of your constituents. And in addition, we'd look at how they can negotiate with management. Well, we, the gender norms angle that we embedded into this program is having gender reflections for women and men about their own roles in society and how that affects them in the workplace and potentially how they can represent um, their constituents in the committees. And through which, you know, worker, uh, worker representatives think about what they can do more in terms of voicing concerns related to gender equality and inclusion, and also in creating space. So we see a lot of success through our male engagement that men see that they have a very active and important role in creating that space for women to openly share in these committees. And we hope to have a follow-up session where we bring the different peer groups together for further action planning and experience sharing. And in terms of the paid work in care, in Bangladesh, uh, in partnership with UNICEF, we have a program called Mothers at Work. And it's a comprehensive program looking at promoting maternity protection, breastfeeding, and childcare facilities in the workplace. And this is done through, so through a workplace diagnostic. Again, we could not do this without the support and leadership of the work, worker and management committees, where we assess the existing policies and maternity protections and the quality of childcare facilities and breastfeeding facilities. And the sustainability of this program is only ensures through their, the committee's active engagement to continue awareness raising and also continuous improvement on the policies and processes. And the interesting part about this program is that during COVID-19, it is really through the worker and management committee's leadership where they focus more on the occupational health and safety risks for pregnant workers and also lactating mothers and mothers with young children who are returning to work to ensuring that the childcare facilities uh, take in the appropriate health measures. And lastly, on leadership and skills development, we offer a variety of leadership and skills building programs for both workers and management, including the representatives, whether it's communication skills or management skills. But increasingly, we're looking at how we can leverage the worker and management committees to create the enabling environment for women to take on leadership positions. So in Cambodia and Ethiopia, we're aiming to scale our gender mainstreaming workshops that we do with worker management committees to help them understand gender norms, their roles and their impact in the workplace. And we piloted this program in Cambodia last year during COVID and through which we, wrote, we were raising awareness on the gendered impact of COVID-19, especially some of the challenges that are different for women and men workers. Uh, next slide, please. And beyond the factory level, Better Work is also looking at promoting gender equality and social dialogue with wider global supply chain actors. So in terms of capacity building um, through our flagship program called Better Work Academy, which promotes um, social dialogue through direct trainings with brands and retailers for them to replicate what Better Work does globally. We have done so by mainstreaming gender equality and inclusion into our social dialogue training. So workplace communication, how to set up and run workers' committees in a gender-sensitive way, and how to also set up grievance mechanisms that are gender-sensitive and inclusive. And again, a lot of lessons that we're drawing from the IR toolkit, but also we, we're really excited this is now being launched because then we can also share this toolkit with our brand partners who are really excited for, for, for the ability to use this. Um, and other capacity building that we've done with the brands is on gender reflections uh, and looking at how grievance mechanism can take into account of sensitive issues such as sexual harassment and the importance of working with additional stakeholders such as governments, nonprofit organizations as well, especially through referral pathways. 
And on in terms of capacity building in Cambodia um, in 2019, we also held a two day workshop with not only the brands and retailers and vendors, but also with constituents to look at how we can collectively in a multi-stakeholder platform to address the issue of gender-based violence and harassment. And through the academy, we're also advising on the strategies and approaches. So beyond training, we're also looking at some of the sustainability strategies of the companies we work on and really drawing from the lessons from other ILO colleagues and their expertise and our experience is better work to look at how they can en engage their vendors and suppliers in a more gender equal way. And through our partnership with brand partners as well, we're able to scale our gender equality work. Uh, in 2019, with one of our brand partners, we were able to conduct uh, 27 learning seminars, reaching 400 suppliers globally in sexual harassment prevention. And because of this partnership, we're now doing a lot of follow-up activities with the factories, uh, including the pilot program, which I mentioned earlier, in Nicaragua. And some of the brand partners have also supported the scaling of our initiatives, such as Mothers at Work, and also GEAR, a uh, women's leadership program in Bangladesh and Vietnam. And finally, in terms of the national level agenda, we are supporting our ILO colleagues to support tripartite constituents where relevant. And understanding the gender impact of COVID-19 and potential increased risk of discrimination, difficulties in balancing work and family responsibilities and greater prevalence of gender-based violence and harassment, we see an increased need to step up our efforts in, in, in this regard. Uh, one thing that we started doing more, for instance, in Jordan, is we're building the capacity of our labor inspectors who are seconded into our program. Uh, we take them through a comprehensive training on gender equality and inclusion, as well as gender-based violence prevention and remediation. And I think in many other countries, we're starting to identify referral pathways for victims and survivors. While we try to promote remediation at the workplace level, sometimes that's not sufficient. So hopefully this year and beyond, better work will continue mapping referral pathways through the support of the constituents to ensure that workers do get support, not only when they encounter cases of violence and harassment in the workplace, but also domestic violence. And, and lastly, just to summarize, you know, we are glad that we're able to take our learnings and experience to contribute and support the development of IR toolkit and especially on how we can adapt it to the garment sector context. And we are really looking forward to taking the IR toolkit to complement and enhance our existing initiatives, both at the factory and supply chain levels, which I shared earlier. Uh, and we also look forward to sharing this with our brand partners in the future. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. That is all from my end. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for your presentation. And also, thank you very much for linking so nicely your presentation and next presentation on the toolkit. So uh, thank you very much for that. Any questions to Jessica about uh, what Better Work is doing and her presentation can be uh, directly the, to her directly in the chat box. So thanks once again. And uh, indeed, let's look at uh, uh, at uh, this uh, toolkit on uh, gender, uh, non-discrimination, violence, and harassment. Before I give the floor uh, to Andrea Franconi, uh, just a, a kind reminder uh, what the uh, toolkit is about, I think that some of you are now very much aware about it, but uh, for the people attending for the first time our masterclass um, series, I think it's important that they know that this toolkit has been developed by uh, the ILO and the ITC ILO, it's a training center. Uh, it's a set of training materials for the promotion of sound industrial relations, and you can see on your screen the different topics. Uh, that are uh, covered by this uh, toolkit. Uh, it's part of an effort to also put together many, many materials that have been uh, developed over the years and to develop new uh, uh, activity. It's been piloted at country level and we are constantly updated and upgrading the, uh, the toolkit. Uh, what we would like to uh, just remind you is that this is the eCampus of the ITC ILO. It's a free of charge. You can just create your account. And just by creating your account, you will be able to access the uh, Industrial Relations Global Toolkit. You will be able to search for a course and to access it. This is how it looks like. Uh, and I'm just I'm not going to spend a lot of time just to say that by accessing the Industrial Relations Global Toolkit, you will be able to uh, access a set of training activities and training tools that you can use to design and to deliver a training session 
on a number of topics, obviously collective bargaining, negotiation skills, workplace cooperation, um, grievance handling, conflict dynamic, uh, but about soft skills and industrial relations in times of crisis. And uh, actually the uh, latest modules that we've just been added to the toolkit is the one on um, uh, gender non-discrimination, uh, violence and harassment. For presenting the toolkit, I'm going to give the floor and I'm going to stop sharing for a few seconds my screen because I'm going to give the floor to my um, good colleague and expert Andrea Franconi, who has been uh, the main, uh, let's say, uh, 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 brain be behind the design of this toolkit and especially uh, in terms of uh, the drafting. So Andrea, thank you very much for being with us and for uh, uh, driving us through the toolkit and uh, to show us a bit the kind of resources that we can uh, access by logging to the uh, ITC Iloi campus. Wow. So Andrea, over to you. Well, thank you, Silva. Thank you for that introduction. I'm very happy to join you today. And especially in this occasion to present this new training model on gender, non-discrimination, violence and harassment for industrial relations. We know that incorporating the fundamental principles and rights of work, paying special attention to non-discrimination, gender equality, zero tolerance to violence and harassment in the world of work are key elements for a successful industrial relations system. And in that matter, mainstreaming gender in industrial relations involves the integration of gender perspective into all different areas and scenarios of industrial relations. So with this model, what we aim to do is to build the capacity of the stakeholders, both at the sectoral and factory level to address industrial relations, non-discrimination, violence and harassment from a gender perspective as a fundamental element to increase the possibilities for both women and men in equal conditions and opportunities to achieve a better future of work. An important mention, therefore, is that the gender is mainstream all through the different units, and the model is composed by eight units in total. These uh, units each has uh, their own training activities and supporting materials, and it in, in each training activities, you will find objectives, target group, complexity, specific materials. Uh, and then in some training activities, you will also find tips for the facilitator to implement the exercise. These training activities are adapted both for presential and virtual training with the general and specific indications on how to implement them in each uh, training context. So in addition to this, we have developed um, eight PowerPoint presentations, one for each unit with theoretical context for the facilitator to be used, whether for the preparation or as part of the training. So these PPPs include images, statistics on the labor market and conditions, phrases of main characters who have advocated for this right, as well as some ILO uh, reports on the topics. In some cases, they also include links to videos and materials of ILO, EPIC, he for she UN campaign, among others. So now let's see a bit more about these units that I'm telling you about. And we will focus um, on the social dialogue scope, but in a bigger scope, considering social dialogue, you remember, I think that you already seen this in the other master classes, but we are talking about all the negotiation, consultation, or simple exchange of information between or among representatives of the governments, employers and workers on the issues of common interests relating to economic and social policy. So let's go now to share my screen because we will go into the toolkit. I hope that you are able to see it. Okay. So in the first uh, unit, you will find that we have um, three main topics. One is gender barriers in the labor market. Then we uh, approach gender mainstreaming in industrial relations and building female leadership, as uh, Jessica was mentioning before. Uh, you will see that many of the contents that Jessica was talking about are reflected also here in the ER toolkit. And we have developed different activities. And when we um, 
try to approach these topics, we went from different um, areas, starting from gender as a social construction. Then we talk about the difference between what is gender, what is sex. Uh, we also try to uh, approach the gender stereotypes, the roles, the values, the norms, but both on masculinity and femininity. And this is very important because we are talking about what are the main barriers that women and girls face to be able to access the labor market. And of course, we needed to approach the limitations that girls have to access education. And for this matter, the counterpart is it is very important to approach masculinities and stereotypes that not only limit women, but also limit men in the way that they can um, develop their activities in society. We need to realize that we have to take an approach where he or she is also important. Therefore, uh, we included the uh, main role that men has in promoting gender equality and uh, this is where we try to approach it from the he for she campaign on the un trying to focus on how important it will be to uh, count with that contribution for this matter and going a bit farther we try to approach the underlying causes of gender inequalities and of course we needed to to talk about power relations and gender and this this imbalance that that uh, relies be, behind the the equation of the current situation in the labor market also the social assignments of roles where women are um, mainly uh, oriented to a reproductive role and inside those roles how uh, the different distributions of the value recognitions that society assigns to those roles and this is very very important because we are, we have to talk about the unpaid care work and working hours of course but also about the undervalue that society uh, usually assigned to the uh, jobs or the tasks that are usually related with women so these are two um, approaches that we need to talk about and are developed in this training. Um, there are a lot of mentions of um, trying to develop a new approach to the recognition of the unpaid work that women um, are in charge of. And uh, this is where we uh, quote different reports from the ILO, especially uh, the one that uh, Silva was mentioning before, a quantum leap for gender equality for a better future of work for all of us. And uh, then other gender barriers to the labor market uh, about uh, work-life balance. We talk about horizontal uh, occupational segregation and the counterpart that is vertical occupations, occupational segregation, the famous glass ceilings. When we go a little bit farther, uh, we had to introduce ourselves into the reasons and the results of these uh, structural barriers that are the gender gaps, also that uh, they reflect in leadership positions, as uh, Jessica was mentioning before, and as it was also uh, introduced in the poll that we did at the beginning of the session. And in this topic, we uh, try to encourage building female leadership as one main important pillar for achieving gender equality introducing uh, and developing the possibility for women to be part of this social dialogue in the different areas that is developed. And for this, of course, um, taking into account women's participation in the current situation of social dialogue around the world. We uh, needed to, to visualize the need for giving women a voice, not only in the different private sectors, but also in the public sectors and between the social dialogue in the trade unions and employers organizations, and of course, in government representations as well. 
And uh, the last barrier, but not for that matter less important by the opposite, um, violence and harassment in the world of work, as Verena mentioned before, and uh, of course, including the impact that domestic violence has uh, in the possibility of women to incorporate and develop in the labor market. Uh, after this, we try to orientate our training into the key ILO instruments for achieving gender equality in the world of work. I think that this was already mentioned by Verena, including, of course, Convention 190 and Recommendation 206 about violence and harassment, and the fourth path uh, for gender equality in the world of work, that this is also developed in the report A Quantum Leap for Gender Equality for a Better Future of Work for All. Then if we go to the next two units, we will find um, two topics that are broader uh, than uh, gender, but the, uh, that we have to consider from a gender perspective as well, because as we have seen, women are um, disproportionately affected by this phenomenon, especially regarding violence and harassment. So when we develop the non-discrimination principle in industrial relations, we cover the different grounds that are already mentioned by Convention 111, uh, the basic concepts, of course, the intersectionality of discriminations, especially those that may affect women in a different way, and therefore they require a special approach to, to them. Then we introduce into Convention 100, talking about equal pay for work of equal value. And for that matter, we needed to uh, notice the difference between equal pay for equal work and equal pay for work of equal value. These are the two concepts that we uh, develop different training activities to clarify those. And um, the gender neutral job evaluation criteria, the different parameters that should be considered in order to introduce this both in an international but national um, regulation. And uh, when we approach effectively the um, non-discrimination, uh, we relate this topic with violence and harassment and the dynamic of violence and harassment. We needed to develop all of these contents before just to understand the underlying reasons behind violence and harassment and this big scope that the new um, convention 190 and recommendation 206 provides on this matter. Uh, we try to approach different areas and we call it the different W's uh, because we call what is addressed, defin defining violence and harassment finally with a global consensus. Then we talk about who uh, does it involve, where and where does it occur regarding violence and harassment? And finally, how do we address this phenomenon, um, including prevention and protection, enforcement and readiness, uh, guidance and training? Once we covered these different topics, we went into uh, the three last units talking about this big scope of social dialogue, as I was mentioning before. So we cover collective bargaining, grievance handling, workplace cooperation as different tools to fight against discrimination, violence and harassment and to promote gender equality. Uh, therefore, we cover the different dimensions that this, uh, uh, that this could be implemented. We went into the different clauses, what is equality bargaining, what is this so important, what is important to include in the negotiations, uh, women representation, as we were mentioning before, by empowering, empowering their voices into this social dialogue uh, type the typology of collective bargaining provisions. We also went into um, the different ways to fight against violence and um, harassment through collective bargaining, what type of clauses could be implemented, giving also examples uh, of what have already been implemented in different parts of the world. 
And of course, another um, pillar of this social dialogue dynamic is grievance handling mechanisms. And uh, we needed to discuss the different barriers to reporting. And the common barrier seems to be fear, fear of the victims to actually speak because fear of retaliation, for example, and the need for the different grievance mechanisms to attend these barriers in order for them to be effective. Um, and finally, we talk about workplace cooperation, how different um, workplace committees cooperation can include the participation of women and how they can implement different topics in their agenda in order to achieve uh, gender equality and also to fight against discrimination, violence and harassment. So for this matter, we have different training activities, as I mentioned before. There are both virtual and presential. We cover different areas. And our main challenge here was to be able to translate uh, all of the capacities that we uh, were able to build during the presential training into virtual terms. Uh, therefore, you will see many types of uh, um, possibilities. Here we have some role planes, what we call Zoom role, uh, Zoom role play, that is kind of uh, recreating the role plays, but now in a virtual manner. And finally, the last annex of the ER toolkit is a glossary, which uh, basically contains the main concepts and definitions that are introduced and developed during the toolkit in order for them to be uh, known for the facilitators and other people who interact with this new uh, tool. So um, I'm very happy to be able to share this with you right now. And also uh, that this training may be considered as only one part inside of what is meant to be a global and collective effort in order to achieve a better and more equal and more inclusive world of work for both women and men. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Let me uh, share my screen uh, again, uh, just to say that any questions uh, in terms of the toolkit, uh, our colleague Irene can uh, be of support, and uh, everything is accessible on the on our ITC ILO uh, eCampus. So thank you very much uh, to our three speakers. Thank you very much, Verena. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica and Andrea for uh, all this presentation. I know that we have uh, questions from Joanne. I'm gonna ask, give him the floor in a second, just to say that there's been a couple of, there's been a question in the chat box uh, raised by Veronica. I know that Verena has been uh, answering to that questions, but I thought that it could maybe, uh, in case uh, you haven't seen the answer from Verena, it could be uh, uh, interesting from Verena to maybe uh, already tell us a bit more to about uh, answers to Veronica's question, which is about uh, why is the loss of employment uh, larger for women during the pandemic? Uh, so I think, uh, Verena, I'm not sure that everybody had the chance to look at your answers, and I think it would be a good question to, to think about. And there's also some questions that I'm very uh, curious to hear Verena and, uh, and uh, Jessica answer. It was raised uh, on the uh, uh, on the questions uh, when people were registering. It was about the role of multi-stakeholders initiative in addressing gender equality and non-discrimination in global supply chain. So, Verena and uh, also maybe Jessica would be very much uh, curious to hear about you in terms of these questions. But before I ask you to answer these questions, let me turn on to Joanne, who raised his hand. Uh, oh, I think it's it. E, so uh, it's end. Uh, so, Joan, over to you. Thank you, Sylvain. I think I actually made this uh, by mistake. I did not mean to raise my hand, but thank you for being so uh, <laughs> attuned, just attuned to, to what's happening in the chat. Okay, I mean, you can see that uh, when somebody raises a uh, hand, uh, we ask the uh, people to, I mean, uh, to speak. Eh? So uh, thanks, uh, Joanne, no worry for that. So uh, maybe uh, wait, while waiting to see if there's any more questions for our speakers, I would like to turn to Verena and maybe to ask her to, to elaborate a bit, of, a bit more about, I mean, to, to tell us a bit about what has been her answers to Veronica's question, and then uh, maybe to tell us a bit about uh, multi-stakeholders uh, initiative. So Verena, over to you. 
Um, thank you, Sylvain, and uh, thanks to Veronica for the question. So the question was, uh, why? what are the reasons why women proportionately um, have uh, lost uh, more employment, have been more infected by employment loss than, than men uh, due to the pandemic? And I would say there's two main reasons. Um, the main reason, uh, the most important reason is that the sectors that have been most affected by the pandemic um, have um, uh, have women, uh, predominantly women, uh, working in there. For example, hospitality, meaning um, uh, restaurants and also hotels, uh, have had huge uh, have have uh, greatly impacted on women. Particularly, uh, a lot of them were um, were employed in a precarious way. In any case, it was easy to uh, dismiss them. Um, some of them uh, were lucky enough to have uh, short working hours, at least for a year, but these programs uh, are, are also um, uh, closing down now. For example, Australia, uh, just this week, um, the uh, program uh, terminated. Uh, so now, even though they, the women had um, uh, rights to, to replacement salary, to short working uh, schemes, uh, this is uh, finished now. Uh, another area is commerce, uh, particularly shops. Um, again, a very high degree of uh, women workers in there and also leisure facilities in many countries closed down. And again, um, women were overrepresented. Another reason is that due to the closure of the care uh, facilities uh, for people with uh, mental or physical disabilities for old age care, but also schools, um, particularly at primary level, um, uh, some people, some women particularly had to um, resign from their job uh, due to care um, responsibilities. Uh, it was not possible for them to, to continue working and look after the children. Uh, so they, um, they resigned from, from, their, from their jobs. And this of course also, um, I mean, women were proportionately affected by this, but also poorer parts of the population where in professional jobs, you might be able to reconcile work uh, and care responsibilities due to more flexibility in working times. Uh, this was not possible uh, for some of the um, uh, manual workers, for example. On the uh, multi-stakeholder initiative, I think uh, one very important uh, area are uh, international framework agreements, um, where gender equality, if you look at the, uh, the earliest, uh, international framework agreements, it was more about the core uh, standards of the ILO, uh, including gender equality, but um, it was mostly about collective bargaining and freedom of association, which of course is extremely important. But the later ones now, uh, the more recent ones, uh, uh, most of them have substantial inclusion of gender equality, maternity leave, non-discrimination, uh, uh, one, I think it was even from uni I saw where, um, uh, violence and harassment was was already included. So this, these are very hopeful signs, and I'm sure Jessica can can mention also other initiatives. Thanks, Silva. Thank you very much, uh, Verena. Jessica. Actually, I, I wanted to talk about a need for a multi-stakeholder initiative. Actually, that came out of um, our work experience with CY90. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we've been doing a lot of capacity building and development of policies and mechanisms and workplaces, but we see what's really missing is a referral pathways. And also, you know, the capacity of trade unions in supporting um, workers to experience violence and harassment. And what we mean is adopting a victim-centered approach. This is a very new concept. And I want to draw back to what Andrea said earlier, being fear being a big barrier. And I think there's a lack of awareness, a capacity of at the workplace level and also beyond in addressing this issue. So this is where you need a multi-stakeholder initiative because it's not enough for workplaces to have grievance mechanisms. We need support from government to have referral services and health counseling and legal services for workers. So this is something that we find as a need. And we are now, luckily we are piloting something um, in partnership with the IFC and a manufacturing group in Jordan, which we're looking at building the capacity of the worker center to provide exactly this. To, to really help workers deal with cases of violence and harassment, particularly migrant workers who speak different languages other than Arabic uh, in Jordan. So in C, especially in C190, we do see that it's not enough to have workplace mechanisms, but we do need multi-stakeholders involved. 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jessica, and thank you very much, uh, Verena, for 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 this. Uh, uh, for answering those questions. So I think that uh, uh, it gives us uh, even more uh, will to actually uh, look at the different publications and the different tools that were mentioned. And uh, so thank you very much for that. Let me check if there's any more questions before we move to uh, the um, closure, and the closing remarks. I think that we are completely on time and aligned with what was our initial uh, schedule. So, um, I don't see any further questions. So maybe let me stop now. I would like to thank once again our three speakers. Thank you very much, Verena. Thank you very much, Jessica and Andrea for uh, all the inputs. Uh, uh, um, I know that at some point uh, uh, in the chat box, uh, we will be seeing some more information and some links uh, will be appearing so where you can access some of the resources uh, that have been uh, mentioned. And uh, but thank you very much to the three of you of being with us today and to tell us and to, to give us a better understanding of uh, what has been done and what still needs to be done uh, for the promotion of uh, gender equality and especially through uh, sound industry regulation. So thank you very much to the three of you. Let's maybe move to uh, some closing remarks. And uh, before I give the floor back to Veronica, I would just like to say that uh, indeed that was the last uh, of our five uh, masterclass uh, on uh, industry on the sound industrial relations. So thanks very much to everybody that has been contributed um, uh, uh, to this different masterclass. Uh, we were very happy and we were very proud to introduce to you the different training tools and materials that have been produced uh, over around these uh, five different topics uh, that we that have been the uh, let's say the subjects of the discussion uh, during the last month. Uh, just like to emphasize that there is more on the industrial relations global toolkit that we did not touch about. So I hope that you will still have the, I mean, you will be curious to see what are some other tools uh, that we did not have a chance to introduce, but that do exist. And I would like to say that uh, also thanks to support of Global Deal, we've been able to translate and to adapt uh, many of these tools in uh, French, in Spanish. And actually uh, next month uh, will be devoted for us to the design and the launching of our new platform on the e-campus of the uh, Industrial uh, Relations Global uh, Toolkit. So it will be multi-language, English, French, and Spanish, uh, these materials are not all fully uh, available in all languages, in, in the three languages, but uh, let's say a, a, a significant uh, majority of, uh, of them. So it will be accessible online, it will be, um, it will be in, uh, uh, in the three languages. I hope so that it will help you uh, also to maybe reach out an audience uh, that is uh, uh, non-English speaking, uh, first of all, and in other regions of the world. And, uh, and um, I think that uh, thanks to our colleagues from the, the Global Deal, we'll be able to inform you about the progress of this platform so that when it's ready and it's launched, uh, you receive the new link so that you can connect and you can access uh, these different uh, uh, resources. So um, thanks everybody. And I'm gonna hand over to uh, Veronica right now. Veronica, over to you. Thank you so much, Sylvain, and a big thank you to all our participants and the fantastic speakers. Um, I think it was good that we started uh, with the poll. I think it was good to be reminded that uh, um, a big part of the um, unpaid work uh, is still being done by women. And when I saw the figure, 70%, I was thinking, hmm, that was even worse than I thought, actually. So um, it's it's a lot of additional work. Um, and I, I think it was also good to show that pandemic has had a different impact on women and, and men. Um, that's also something we, we mustn't forget. But there were also good news. And what we heard from Better Work, uh, for example, that the with the thanks to their work, the gender pay gap has decreased to 17%. Uh, so that's an important achievement. It has to go down even further, uh, but but this is very good. Um, so I, I thought it was really interesting today and uh, I have learned many new things. Um, I would like to also recall that the, um, the training module on gender 
non-discrimination, violence and harassment. Uh, you can access it um, either from our website or the ITC website. Uh, we will also, also send you the recordings of the sessions. I noticed some came late and, and sometimes because of Wi-Fi connections and so on, sometimes people drop out and come back. So if you want to watch this again, you're most welcome. We will send you the link um, to, to all the participants. Um, and uh, as I said before, on our website, you will find the information on the previous sessions that we have had and uh, the links to the training materials. And lastly, a big thank you to the ITC. It has been great working together on, on this uh, masterclass series, and I'm sure we will, be, we will have other opportunities in the future uh, to work together. So thank you again to all of you, and um, I hope to see you in some other Global Deal events and other ITC events. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Barbara.